minutes. So hopefully the system works. So good evening, everybody. I'm recording this on Friday evening and we'll be posting it soon. So you will have a chance to take a look at my uh, summary of the argu economic arguments about federalism probably over the weekend. So today or this week, we discuss two papers that deal with one problem, one and the same problem, as you have probably seen, there is a quite a bit of overlap between them. The Charles Thibault paper from 1956, and the second one is the paper from the Cato Institute, Cato Journal, which also deals with the with the problem of federalism, fiscal federalism, decentralization, and so on. The Thibault paper was, uh, I will spend most of the time on it, because it it was hugely influential in the literature of economic uh, uh, economics of federalism and economics of, uh, of decentralization from 1950s onwards. Uh, and it started an entire literature that came to be known later as theory of fiscal federalism or theory uh, justifying decentralization of power by the perceived or real economic benefits that the decentralized system uh, provides for society. So federalism as a system is well known to all of you, or most of you, as a politics majors, you are familiar with the basics, basic principles of American political thought in history. You know that federalism is the is how the American government was set up from the very beginning. And the Cato paper, the other paper, talks about the you know, federalist papers and the constitutional design of the American system of government and the reasons and arguments that Madison and others uh, invoked you know, when, when they created the federal government. So the federal system of government is, um, I can say, it's, this, this is funny because at, at one level it's an American invention. So you don't have federal countries in the 18th century Western world or anywhere else in the world. The American system is the first federal system. On the other hand, the weird thing is that the federal system of political relationships existed and was very widespread in the Middle Ages and even started in the Roman period in the Roman Republic was organized on the federal level, that you have the different cities, different city-states connected with certain common rules and obligations with the central authority in Rome, while retaining, while retaining a significant amount of local political author authority and autonomy. So federalism was rampant in, 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 in the Middle Ages, or we can say a very decentralized and loosely governed system of political relationships. You had all kinds of local political communities and kingdoms, dukedoms, uh, local republics, uh, small, small republics uh, or small uh, royal Cities, cities and city-states and so on. So a variety of different political forms and the political geography of the Middle Ages is extremely decentralized, extremely fragmented. That was one of the, when you look historically, one of the reasons for gradual um, spread of economic progress and cultural uh, advance in the high Middle Ages was related to this absence of, a, of an overarching or universal political power covering the entire continent. This extreme independence between different, in, independence of different, usually small territorial units, small states. So large scale 
state covering large territories were the exception. So you had the first nation states that were created, the first, uh, let's call them large territorial states, were the French kingdom and Spanish kingdom, later on England. But even these states in the, in the 15th century, 14th and 15th century, centuries were far less centralized than modern nation states. However, as soon as the modern absolute monarchies got going, the 15th century, especially 16th century onwards, they started systematically crushing and undoing all subnational sources of social and political authority. The arist aristocracy, the church, local political collegia and, co and communities and, and local municipal governments and so on. So from the 16th century onwards, the scope of political decentralization in Europe had shrunk dramatically. Uh, one of the fortunate aspects of American political experience was that the Americans came uh, from Europe, colonized America, and they brought with them these older customs, older customs of local self-government and political self-governance, and they, in, in the absence of strong absolute monarchies, they continued practicing their ancient customs in, in America from the very beginning onwards. So these old medieval traditions of local political autonomy, local political self-government that existed and thrived in, in the high Middle Ages and in the early modern period that were crushed in Europe by the absolute monarchies, monarchies survived in America and thrived in America. And that's why I sometimes just half-jokingly say that America is the last European medieval society in the sense that these institutions that are European and medieval, like the township democracy or the local political county governments or local governments, this jealous political localism and ethos of decentralized, uh, uh, fragmented, dispersed power, that's a medieval sentiment, that's a medieval view of political order that got swamped in the in, in the modern times in Europe by abs first absolute monarchies and then abs even more so from the 18th and 19th centuries, the centralized modern nation state, which is not monarchical anymore. It is democratic, but nevertheless, it is not less centralized and consolidated politically. So one, one interesting, one interesting, uh, side note here or illustration of this would be Tocqueville. You, all of you heard about Alexis de Tocqueville and Tocqueville in his book Democracy in America that he writes in 1830s. So you know about who Alexis de Tocqueville was. He visited America and he was surprised by, by many things that he saw and one of the things that, by which he was most impressed was exactly this uh, localist tradition of self-government especially the New England township democracy. That's something that he was so impressed by, this idea that people come together on a city square in a small town and then they discuss and deliberate the policy issues and they vote and they collectively decide what to do and they, then they go about doing it. And they don't need the supervision of any wise overlord in the, in the capital city. They do most of the things affecting their daily lives are regulated by the decisions that they themselves make in the city square, this township democracy. So, so he was so impressed by this, and he thought to himself, I cannot see anything like that in Europe. This is something new in the world. So he used this phrase, something new in the world, for the American township democracy and American local self-government. And then he came back to France, and he started writing a book, about the French Revolution, how French Revolution came to be, and he wrote an even better book than Democracy in America, which is not very often read in America, but in Europe it is a, <coughs> excuse me, in Europe it is a to-go book about, that interprets 
what happened with the French Revolution and what happened in European political society. The book is called The Ancien Regime and the Revolution, The Old, the old Regime and the Revolution. And what Tocqueville discovered was that the political centralization of power in France that culminated and grew even more uh, after the French Revolution was already happening for a few centuries in, in France. That the revolutionaries just embraced the tools of political centralization and consolidation that, that were bequeathed to them by the old royal authorities. And that this entire, so he chronicles masterfully this entire process of gradual dissolution of all um, inherited medieval sources of political authority like the aristocracy, the church and local communities and so on. And he discovered one thing that greatly surprised him. He says in, in, the, in the footnote, in one of the footnotes in the ancient regime, he said, while studying in French and German medieval archives, he discovered the same thing that he discovered in America, the township democracy, people coming together in a village or in a town and then voting and deliberating and deciding what to do without any supervision from the king or from the central government. He said, gee, I was wrong, actually. This thing that I knew was something new in the world, this township democracy was just, he says, just the medieval European parish Trans, transplanted or, or 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 transported into the new world and liberated of all the remnants of aristocratic uh, European traditions. So that's the, the the New England township democracy was just a European self-governing parish or small political community that tried across Europe, in England, in France, in Germany. So he realized how wrong he was actually that, 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 that America provided some radical, that American type of federalism and self-government and political localism was something new and modern. It was anything but. It was actually a re, reinvention or reapplication of the old and abandoned and crushed European tradition. So that's then federalism. You know how all that evolves in America over time and eventually got its sanction in the American Constitution, which divides up the power between the two levels of government and gives so much power to, lo to local and federal governments. And you see even now one specificity of America, when you look one somber and kind of weird illustration of this, but maybe so, so, something that is on everyone's, uh, everyone's mind right now. When you look at the statistics of coronavirus, uh, infections and deaths from any country in Europe you get you get national figures in America you cannot get all that because the states are taking care of health care and then you have to go collecting and uh, adding up the numbers and this state is is imposing a lockdown another state is not doing it and Florida doesn't want to do it and and, and New York does it whereas in Italy in Spain in France you see the central government comes along and says we're going to do this and the next day everybody at the local level of government just marches in lockstep according to the melody uh, and the rhythm prescribed prescribed by, by the central government that doesn't work that way in America. American federal system is much stronger than in most other western countries this federalist ethos. Okay now what to think, how to think about the economic effects, about the economic uh, consequences of the federal system. Or maybe more precisely, what these two papers do is actually how can we make sense of federalism as a political system by using the tools of economic analysis that we have. So remember, we economists, we are imperialists, so we want to invade and, and, uh, and uh, simply profanize everything and anything to apply our cost-benefit analysis and our, and our shallow materialistic reductionism to all sacred things, including political system, and especially political system, and political sacred cows. So now we're going to apply economic models to understand what's going on with federalism in division of powers. So how can we do it? So you, you saw, if you read, if you read Thibault, 
it's very simple. He attempts or he tries. Some people say he succeeds, some, some are critical, essentially to apply the well-known model of perfect competition from the microeconomic theory to politics. So you remember uh, us discussing how the concepts of competition and concepts of exchange and supply and demand are applied in public choice, that you have politicians who are voters and you have the custom uh, uh, po politicians who are suppliers, I'm sorry, it's too late in the day. Okay. So politicians are suppliers, voters are buyers, what is being traded are public policies, bureaucrats are managers who carry out the decisions that are made by voters, authorizing politicians, and so on. So, so, so the entire supply and demand analysis is applied to the political process. In constitutional economics, in thinking about federalism versus centralization, costs and benefits, or one or the other, we use this, the model of perfect competition. So competition, the idea is that we should look at the decentralized federalist model of government as a system analogous to the perfect competition or perfect competitive equilibrium in the price theory. That's a model that we invoked at the very beginning of the course, as you remember, as, a, as an idealized description of a um, competitive uh, economic system in which you have on the one hand producers and suppliers, on the other hand you, you have buyers, consumers. So here suppliers would be the competing local governments. So this is the idea. Competing local governments uh, will be uh, equivalents of perfectly competitive firms, firms that try to offer goods and services at given prices to consumers. Voters or citizens of local political communities will be the equivalent of, of buyers on the perfectly competitive market. So you will now remember what are the principles of perfectly competitive model. The principles are free entry and exit in business. Then uh, the prices are given. In advance, there is a large number of firms, large number of firms. Then uh, there are there, there is no advertising or any other kind of trying to influence the to influence the supply to influence the product. Uh, buyers have full knowledge, perfect knowledge about the characteristics of the products so on. Buyers can decide to switch from one supplier to another supplier and so on. So there is a perfectly competitive and there are no externalities. That's one thing. So th there, are no, there are no situations in which one firm by producing something uh, imposes costs to the third parties that are not paid for by that firm. So what Thibault wants to do is actually to to try and look at the federalist system as, as American through the lenses of this perfectly competitive model to try to apply it to the political field of federalist analysis and to see what will be the outcomes of that, what will be the results. And, and here on, on the page 419 you have actually a summary of the principles, a summary of the assumptions that he that he uh, postulates for, for such an analysis. So the first is that consumer waters are fully mobile and will move to that community where their preference patterns, which are set, are best satisfied. So that's the equivalent to saying that consumers can move freely from one firm to another and buy the product from a firm that they consider to, to, to satisfy their preferences in the best possible fashion. Consumer waters are assumed to have full knowledge of differences among revenue and expenditure pattern and to react to these differences. So they have full knowledge about the costs 
and benefits that they derive from buying certain public policies in a certain in a certain subnational jurisdiction or certain state or county you can conceptualize the local government in a variety of ways you can say it's a it's a state but it's even better to to, to think of the local community as a county or a large city government so they have the full knowledge about about the characteristics of products that they purchase there are a large number of communities in which the consumer waters may choose to live so it's not enough to have two or three so this is the equivalent of this idea of a large number or ideally infinite number of competing firms competing suppliers restrictions to do due to employment opportunities are not considered it may be assumed that all persons are living on dividend income so you don't want to uh, you want to isolate here the different outcomes based only on the characteristics of government policies so you don't to muddy you don't want to muddy the waters by our, by taking into account that in one country you might have better employment opportunities but worse government policies and then so that can mess up your calculation you want to control for the employment opportunities you say all other things being equal this ceteris paribus uh, restriction you want just to see you just want to analyze the uh, relationship between government policies and decisions of people to move from one jurisdiction to another and there are no externalities these these five uh, basic ideas that there are no externalities uh, external economies or diseconomies between communities so that means that there is no situation whereby one community can build an infrastructure object that will benefit another community without without that community paying for the costs of that object okay or so that's the uh, the absence of external economies external, you can call them positive externalities so let's say that the north dakota builds i don't know an airport or something else that that benefits south dakota even more so than the north the north dakota so then we incur the costs that in order to benefit ourselves and then the south dakotans are free riding on our infrastructure investment and the second thing is that there are not these economies which means that that it's assumed that in one local community you cannot create environmental pollution in order to economically benefit but then spread the costs to other communities as well so they don't derive any benefits from your industry working but they have to pay the costs of your industry working okay so what is the main what is the main idea what is the main conclusion here if if you assume that this model works if this model works perfectly then you will have a perfect uh, freedom to move from one jurisdiction to another and if you if you parcel down so to speak if you if you fragment enough political geography if you if you make the political unit so small so small eventually the federalist system can function in the same way in which the perfectly competitive firm can function so then providing the best services that those jurisdictions that provide the best possible service at the, at the lowest possible price service meaning government services in government government operating the regular government functions so those jurisdictions that provide the best mix of appropriate taxation and government expenditure will attract the citizens and those jurisdictions that fail to do so will suffer from the people voting with their feet so moving from one jurisdiction to another so this the, there has to be this assumption of the freedom of movement that you can move from one subnational jurisdiction to another so if you so, so the final conclusion here if you if you fragment the, the political units enough then politics and political uh, 
limitations on human cooperation will tend to diminish the ability of uh, governments to exploit individuals and to mistreat individuals will diminish because of their freedom of movement from one place to another, their freedom to uh, abandon the high cost jurisdictions for a greener pastures of a lower cost and a more appropriate regulation jurisdictions. And in, 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 a, in a certain way, making political exchange, making political behavior more akin to economic behavior. This increased level of competition will, will tend to relax this strict uh, division between political and economic. So on the one end, just to illustrate what I mean by this, on the one end you have like a continental scale centralized nation state like China or Russia, which one man or one group of people in Beijing or Moscow decides every, everything that needs to be done and everyone just follows the orders and carries out the decisions made by the central government. So that's one extreme of possible, possible forms of human cooperation. On the other end, you have a perfectly competitive markets in which nobody gives any orders and nobody has any coercive power over, over anyone. And then, although we are used to thinking about politics and economics in this dichotomous way, and on the one hand, you have politics, which is a sphere of coercion and organized violence, and the state, as we know, so what is the definition, Marx Weber's definition of the state? It's a territorial monopoly of power, the territorial monopoly of coercion over a given, given uh, land, given territory, and the population. So then almost everybody, so many people, uh, divide up sharply political form of cooperation and communication, no matter how large territorially the political unit is, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the voluntary sphere of cooperation, civil society, economic markets, and so on. So what is the main argument that Thibault puts forward here is that the things can get a little bit gray in between and a little bit less easy to define when you reduce further and further the size of the political order. When you go as low as like the township democracy or a small town democracy or, or, or a village democracy, if you if you imagine that all political units in America are so reduced that it is not the states anymore, 50 states that are constitutional subnational orders of government, but rather small small towns like Bismarck or Fargo or Jamestown and so on. That you have the thousands of states or thousands of political units in America. So then what is the argument that then political competition among these different territorial units would be much stronger and the ability of people to choose the jurisdictions of their of their choice of their of their preference will be, will have been much much greater in the same way in which the competition increases when you have 200 or 2000 different different firms to choose from and then the coercive power of the state would gradually diminish more and more and more as you as you download the power, so to speak, from the central government, from the, to the state government, to the local level of government. So the political relationship between citizens loses some of its coercive power as you as you drop the level as as you as you uh, bring down the level at which political decisions are are made from the national government to the local political unit so there is there is a there is a difference between how you treat the level of coerciveness and the level of the level of uh, imposition 
on you and your preferences when the, when, a, when a bureaucratic agency or Congress makes a decision about your life in Washington, D.C. That's one thing. Your state government or, or, or the governor, that, that could be slightly different. But it's fundamentally different when you have one small village and small town in which many people know each other, that we, when we make decisions about ourselves, the sense of coercion, the sense of limitations of our freedom, liberty and power is far less. So then there is a certain point of fragmentation of political powers that this, that this strict boundary between the state and the civil society disintegrates. If you can imagine that you have like in one building, I live in an apartment building, and if we set up our own government, it would have been difficult to treat that as a, as a, as a coercive power. Like you can say a majority can make decisions and so on, but then in a corporation, majority shareholders make decisions. That doesn't make you argue that the, that the corporations are governments, that the corporations are coercive associations only because majority of people can make decisions in the name of everybody else. So by the same token, if you, if you download the political power uh, low enough, then they, the coercive nature of political relationship dissolves gradually. So this dissolution or, or the watering down of the coercive nature of political communication coincides with the strengthening of the economic, uh, with the strengthening of competition among the political units and the strengthening of the uh, widening up of the menu of choice that citizens have for choosing in which community to live. But the key assumption for this process to work is that people have a right to vote with their feet, as it is said, to vote with their feet, which means to move from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction. If that doesn't exist, then everything is lost. Then, then the power of local communities to um, coerce citizens increase dramatically. So interestingly enough, this system of government that Thibault describes as the as as a as an ideal in a sense was envisioned by Thomas Jefferson, and I, I encourage you I encourage you to read about it. Uh, this idea of a world republic, as he said, he wanted for for Thomas Jefferson, who was a big proponent of political decentralization. American states were too large political units. He wanted to decentralize power even more than that. And he envisioned these small world republics, like a local government. So this would be just even uh, Bismarck would have been too large political unit for a world republic. We would have had probably five or at least five or six different states in the Burley County. Only. So the Burley County is a, is a kind of gigantic, gargantuan large state that has to be divided up. So he envisioned the entire North American continent consisting of this association, free association of a small local world republic. They would come together only to uh, delegate certain powers to the central government that could not be operated, that could not be carried out at the local level. So you have there's a congruence of that and the old tradition of subsidiarity in the Catholic tradition. That's the same idea of federalism. Subsidiarity means that all functions of a given political or so, uh, religious society should be performed at the lowest possible level, closest to the, to the reality on the ground, and then the higher forms of political and social authority should, should, uh, should get less and less political power. It should be delegated. Less and less of it should be delegated to higher forms. Of government, so that's a Jeffersonian vision. So this is a system like that is a is an institutional precondition for this magic that Thibault describes to work. So freedom of movement, and in a certain sense, that the seat of political authority, seat of political sovereignty, has to be the lowest possible unit. 
it has to be a county or a city or a town or, or a village that has to be the source of political authority and then as you go up along this pyramid of political power to county state and and federal governments they should have less and less and less power so now of course as you can see in modern situation in modern society that's not the case at all that you have very often the opposite that lower you you go the the smaller amount of political power it is especially when you go be, below the state level in in, a, in america the counties and local communities have far less resources have far less uh, influence on everyday life of of their citizens so the state and federal government have a much more power in other countries that is even more so i'll give you one example in in most countries the healthcare system is nationally run healthcare system is organized not only that there are no that there is no market competition even to the degree it exists in america but also there is no decentralized uh, decentralized management of the of the healthcare system however it is operated in terms of ownership private or, or or public everything is run by by the central government national healthcare system that's great britain having all european countries in most countries in in the world that's the way how things are done so that's even more radical even more uh, thoroughgoing and all encompassing than in america so even the degree of decentralization existing in, in in this country is not present in in other european countries so the basic idea here that i want to or to, to impress upon you is to think about uh, how we use and how we can use the economic way of thinking to inform our maybe more uh, um, more thoughtful analysis of the political process in certain categories that we take for granted that may not be taken for granted or to put it in a different fashion how economic analysis can help us to understand this complicated and multifaceted character of political power that political power and the government are not some homogeneous structure that that stands against social power or economic uh, cooperation and social cooperation that political power in 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 itself is heterogeneous and different depending on the territorial scope or the territorial locus of power that once you introduce more competition among local governments you can create a much greater level on much better supply of public services and lower taxes because of the forces of competition that operate on the markets we can apply the same method the same model of analysis to local governments and you can see then the the prediction of this theory economic theory of federalism is that in the same way in which economic competition will make uh, a better product will make a natural selection between different firms favoring and propping up those who offer uh, a superior product at lower prices in the same fashion this federalist competition among jurisdictional competition competition among different political jurisdictions for labor force for people and capital essentially will force them will prop up those jurisdictions that provide a, a superior service superior product which is what is the product it's the public policies services that government provides at lower price what is the price taxation and regulation and the level of meddling into your own life so the, an appropriate balance so we, we don't have to the, the beauty of the system is that we don't have to decide ex ante in advance what is the best form of government what is an optimal level of taxation what is a, an optimal size of government what is it that the government should and shouldn't do so we the beauty of the federalist system as envisioned by thibault is that 
you don't have to make such decisions from first principles and to impose them based on your abstract philosophical reasoning about what is good, what is natural, what is uh, uh, humane, what is democratic or non-democratic. You can allow this political market, in a, in a certain sense, to discover for you this information. So remember Hayek. They said, yeah, the market is a mechanism that uses the prices and supply and demand to discover for us what is the best possible product, what is the best possible use of resources to produce goods and services that people want. So in a similar fashion, we can use the process of political competition among different jurisdictions to discover what is the best form of government and allow, allow people by voting with their feet, by moving from one jurisdiction to another, to tell us what is the best. Who am I and who are you, we smart professors and students of economics and politics and philosophy, to tell people what is the best form of government? What gives us that power? Nothing gives us that power, either us or anyone else. So then let's allow people to vote with their decisions where to locate, where to live, where to pay their taxes, where, where to find their employment, to tell us certain information about which form of government is, is better. So you have a limited, to some degree, limited form of that even in America. You see that some states are losing population, like California, and some states are increasing rapidly. Texas. So there are a variety of reasons that contribute to that, but one of the main reasons are economic opportunities. So their governments might be doing something good since people are flocking there and increasing the increasing the population of these countries. New York State is losing its population. Many other many other states. So now the the, the complicating um, complicating circumstance here is that there might be many other reasons beyond. Uh, government policies that people may decide to move from one state to another. But this is, this is a very important reason, nevertheless. So then if, you, if we download power even further, this significance of local, of local competition and significance of different institutional and legislative regimes for the decisions of people to move or, or, or not move, from one place to another will be even greater, will be even stronger. So the forces that we perceive even in our relatively centralized federal system as it, it is American, as not sufficiently decentralized. So this inter-jurisdictional competition that, that, that are felt, obviously, that are seen, that are undeniable, would have been much, much stronger in a, in a, in a system in which the local communities would be making, making these decisions. So that's that's one very important thing that you that we can apply the economic logic and we can apply the economic way of thinking to uh, understand or to illuminate political process in such a way as to see why federalism might be a superior model of government to centralized for uh, form of government. That's one thing. One conclusion that Thibault brings. Forward. And the second conclusion is that the very character and nature of political power is differently understood now. That there is no bro, there is no very strict line between political and non-political. It depends at which level of government. It depends on the size of the political unit and the rela implied relationship between different units. If the unit is small and there is a perfect um, ability to move among different units, then the coercive nature and coercive character of political power all but disappears. It becomes relatively less important. Okay, so that's just my basic introduction to this stuff, everything that I wanted to tell you uh, tonight. I will post this very uh, soon on uh, on Canvas, so please don't hesitate to send me any questions that you that you might have. 
So one of the limitations, one of the one of the down, downsides of this system of of running running the class is that I don't have your feedback. We would have probably have at least four or five different different digressions and tangents and discussions about all kinds of things if you had the ability to to be either uh, at least virtually present in uh, during the lectures but i decided to post the lectures in this way on youtube because you can access them then until the end of until the end of the semester so then maybe next next week we can we can move if you agree we can move to the live online discussions on canvas because they are preserved for for two weeks so then i wouldn't have to to record these sessions we can we can have live discussions and you will have them recorded until the end until the end of the semester so tell me what you what you think about that send me send me an email or or a message on canvas and don't forget to send me the questions about about this um, lecture and the readings on canvas whatever we decide about the future lectures we should have we should have a schedule one session next week at the minimum i think it's best tuesday or thursday to discuss your papers and to discuss the 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 final exam as well so i will decide that you can you can send me uh on on canvas i will i will post the discussion um discussion group about uh i will open a, a discussion thread about this where you can you can send me what is your preference whether Tuesday or Thursday is the best day for for this class session about about the final paper and about the final exam. So the final exam, somebody sent an email asking about uh, that the new version of the syllabus didn't have the final exam and and paper. They are retained in the in the introductory part of the syllabus, so nothing changed. So. It, the only thing that doesn't uh, exist in the new form of uh, new syllabus is the date for the for the final paper and for the final uh, for the final exam we can discuss that on tuesday as well so provisionally uh, originally we decided that you will have until until the last day of semester so sometime in 20 21st april or maybe even later to submit your paper. I think if I'm not mistaken that April 28th is the deadline for me to submit your grades. So probably the, the deadline for the paper will be 25th, let's say, something like that. And we will make the final exam a few days before that. Okay. Okay, that's all for now. And uh, good night everybody. And I'll see you hopefully on Tuesday live.